The first talk is given by Professor Olga uh, Mokoa. The title of his talk is The Algebras of Lunch One. Let's welcome. Mm -mm. So I can start my talk, right? <laughs> okay, so today I would like to maybe talk about algebra length one. So first we'll discuss what this length function is and why algebras of length of this particular value of length equal to one are interesting and give some characterization of such algebras. And well, first I would like to thank the organizers for the possibility to make a talk at this conference. Um, so the talk is based on a joint research project with my colleagues Consuelo Martinez from the University of Oviedo in Spain and Rodrigo Rodriguez from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. So I'll talk about our joint research. And this would be the plan of my talk. So first I'll give some introduction, main definitions of the length function, some general bounds for the length, the question of length of matrix algebras, because this is a well-known open problem even to calculate the length of such a classical object as the full matrix algebra. And then in the main part of the talk will be about the algebras of length equal to one. Where we'll give a complete characterization of such algebras in different cases, for example, in, for matrix algebras, for associative algebras, and for non associative algebras. So, everything about algebra of length one, and then some general properties of such algebras. Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, could you speak loudly? I, we we don't have uh, enough uh, sound. Mm. Um, sorry, I think I don't hear you very well. So, um, the sound is <laughs> very... okay. It's okay. I can't hear. <laughs> hear you. Can you speak louder, please? So uh, you can follow your talk. Hmm. So should I continue? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So we have an arbitrary field F. So, so far F is just an arbitrary field. Um, and we consider a finite dimensional algebra, which is unitary. So the algebra has a unit and um, Notice that we don't assume associativity of the algebra, so it's just some arbitrary but finite dimensional algebra. And we take a finite subset of S of this algebra and use the following notations. So <coughs> the set with zero indices is just the unity of the algebra. So this one is the unit element and SM is the set of all products of uh, containing at most m letters so they can contain one, zero letter and zero letter is the unit and one letter is just uh, <laughs> why, why didn't you speak? Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
So we have this set of all products of length at most m. And notice that here, since we don't assume associativity, we consider products with all different parentheses. So the word, these words are assumed to be different. And since our algebra is a linear space, we take the linear span and denoted by this angle brackets, the linear span in the vector space. So our set of words spans some linear subspace in the algebra A. And without the index, just L of S is a linear span of all words. And this is this is equal to the unitary algebra generated by the set S. Um, and by construction, we have this chain of containments. So all the spaces are contained one and the other, starting from the smallest one. And of course, they're all included in the algebra generated by S. Here, if S was a generating set for the algebra A, then of course, this algebra equals A. And since everything is finite dimensional, these spaces can't <laughs> grow for very long. So at some step, this space should coincide with the whole algebra because of the assumption that the algebra itself was finite dimensional. So it's just some linear algebra property that the subspaces of a finite dimensional vector space can grow infinitely. Then the smallest such number that this space is already the whole algebra, it is called the length of the given set S. So this is the length of a given set or a generating set. For example, we can take the length of a generating set, but as well, we can take the length of an arbitrary subset. And this is the smallest number, the smallest number of the step at which we have obtained the whole algebra. Uh, notice that if we have a given set S, its length evaluation is just some standard linear algebra, linear algebra problem of constructing a certain basis of the space because we start forming a basis of the spaces constructed of the words in our generator. So we consider words of length one, words of length two, words of length three, and then construct a basis of our algebra. But uh, computationally, it's complex because the number of the words at each step grows exponentially. So we have a lot of words to check <laughs> for the linear independence. So um, this, this is why it may be complex. But of course, it's just some standard procedure which can be done by computer and computational methods. Um, let's consider some small examples so everyone can look on how we can calculate the length of say, some particular set. For example, take this two by two matrices A and B, just being two matrix units, and the zero space would be the space of scalar matrices, so the unit element of the matrix algebra is the identity matrix. And so we have the zero space. The first space is spanned by the identity matrix and the matrices A and B. So it contains matrices of such form that the, their diagonal elements coincide. So of course we can see that the dimension of the space equals to three. And if we make products of length two, there will be two squares of the matrices, which are zero matrices, and the products A, B, and B, A, which are two diagonal matrix units. So on the second step, the space spanned by these words of length at most two is the whole algebra of two by two matrices. So the length of this space of the set S equals two because we have obtained the full matrix algebra. So of course we can't obtain anything bigger than the whole matrix algebra. So here it's step two, we stabilize and say, Okay, the length is two. So this is how we can compute length for some 
given for some particular set. Um, about the this um, this chain of subspaces, there is a great difference in the associative and non-associative cases. So, in the associative case, the sequence of dimensions of the subspaces is a strictly increasing sequence, meaning that until the chain stabilizes, the dimension grows. So, it should be strictly less than the next dimension. <clears throat> and since the difference of dimensions is at least one, so we can, <clears throat> um, if we want to count the number of the steps, the longest chain would be when the difference of this dimension is exactly one. And then we would need, uh, since we start from, zero space, we would need at most dimension of a minus one steps to generate everything. So here the length of any uh, subset of our algebra is bounded by this number, dimension of algebra minus one. And while in the non-associative case, in this sequence, can be, it is of, of course, it is non decreasing, but uh, it shouldn't, it doesn't need to be a strictly increasing sequence. For example, consider uh, an algebra generated by the set B of N elements of the following multiplication rules. So their products, the zero element of the units of the algebra. The, prod, the square of any element is the next element. And the, the square of the last element is zero and the product of any two distinct elements is zero. So here we have this algebra. It is generated by the element E1. So E2 is the square of E1 and then E3 should be the square of E2, etc. But here we, we can see that, for example, on, on, if we consider the words of length three, they're all equal to zero because <coughs> the product, any product of two distinct elements is zero. So here we have, for example, the spaces L2 and L3 coincide, uh, and the spaces from L4 to L7 coincide, etc. So, <clears throat> but for example, the space L4 is different from L3, so it's a bigger space, but it's, it's bigger than L3, but here we at the same space. So for example, the length of the set formed just by one element E1 would be two to the power N minus two. So, and the dimension here is N, so it's not bounded by the dimension. So this is the key difference in the non-associative cases. And here, um, we'll use the result of Alexander and Whitley. Um, they have shown that if the dimensions of the spaces starting from n and until the doubling number two n, if all of them coincide, then the, stabiliz the stabilization of the whole chain of spaces happens. So here we had this from four to seven, but if it was from four to eight, then it would have stabilized. And this is the key property in the non-associative case. So if, if we then take the longest strictly increasing chain subspaces,
with these numbers. Of course, the same idea that the number of the spaces is at most dimension minus one is applicable because they're all subspaces of a finite dimensional vector space, again, as in the previous case. And so obviously we had K non K0 being zero and K1 being one. And so it remains to estimate the gaps between each Ki and Ki i plus one. And since by this proposition, the doubling shouldn't happen, we have this bound that the next number is strictly smaller than doubled previous number. So this is the upper bound in this case. This length wouldn't be bounded by the dimension, but the exponent of the dimension. So this is the, the first main differences in, in the behavior of lengths in associative and non-associative cases. And then we define the length of the whole algebra A, because in the previous definition we had the length of some particular generating set, but the length of the algebra should be something, <laughs> some invariant independent of the choice of the generating set. So we take the maximum among the lengths of all generating sets and this previous bounds on the length of generating sets shows us that this maximum exists. Um, and notice that in this definition, we consider the set of all generating sets of the algebra, and this defines the complexity of length calculation because we can't even make some computer procedure to calculate the length of the algebra because for some algebras, the number of generating sets to check is infinite. So we can't just count them and consider all of them. Um, we need some <laughs> theoretical bounds find the length of the algebra and recall this bound. So length, all this length of the algebra is always bounded by something, uh, some invariant m, which is a function of the dimension of the algebra. So it's dimension minus one in the associative case and two in the power of dimension minus two in the non-associative case. And moreover, <laughs> length, equals in this bound m um, if and only if the algebra is generated by a single element. So consequently, if our algebra can't be generated by one element, the bound can be made a bit better. Taking m minus one, for example, in the associative case, if we consider a non-commutative associative algebra, then it's dimension minus two, non of dimension minus one. Um, if we want to look at some other upper bounds for the length, so they can be obtained as the functions of more than one invariant of the algebra. So in the previous bounds, we just had the dimension. And uh, here, for example, consider the Pupachenis um, result of 1997. So here's length is bounded by a function of two parameters the dimension and the maximal degree of minimal polynomials of elements of our algebra. So since the algebra is finite dimensional and associative, each element has a minimal polynomial and each have a bounded degree. So this number M is always bounded by the dimension of the algebra as well. So this maximum obviously exists. And the length then can be bounded by this <laughs> function with the square root. So asymptotically, it's the square root of the product of dimension and this minimal polynomial. So for example, in some cases, if this invariant is strictly smaller than the dimension that the bound, of course, is better than just it's a dimension because the square root of the, the product would be asymptotically smaller if this maximal degree was smaller than the dimension. Another uh, result in this direction 
Yeah, I was obtained from the commutative, but uh, it will also commutative associative algebras in the function of the same two parameters dimension and maximum degree of the minimal polynomial, but the function here asymptotically is a product of this maximal degree of minimal polynomial and the logarithmic function of the dimension. So we can see that asymptotically it is better than the general bound, but is applicable for commutative algebras. So for example, for commutative algebra, so also the bound exists and it is known that this bound is sharp. So it is known that there exist commutative algebras, for example, the algebra of diagonal matrices for our finite field for which this bound is attained. So this is the exact value of the length much of the bound. Um, uh, a systematic study of the length of non-associative algebras was started and is conducted by Alexander Gutterman and Dmitry Kudryavsky. Uh, but since uh, they are making their talks uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, uh, I wouldn't <laughs> go into details about their results because I don't want to spoil their talks. So I think Alexander and Dmitry would do much better in presenting their results, but for <coughs> the is a study of non-associative algebras and you know, the concept of length of non-associative algebras was introduced by Alexander and Dmitry. Um, a well-known problem in, in the length computation is the um, evaluation of the length of the full matrix algebra in terms of the size of the matrices. It was pulled um, in 1984, so it's uh, 37 years ago, and it still hasn't been solved yet. And so, past conjectured a linear bound that the length of the matrix algebra is a linear function and equals to n minus 2. Um, so far, it is known that it's true for the size of the matrix is not greater than 5, but in general case, it's still an open problem. Even for such a classical object as a matrix algebra, we can say that we know the exact value of the length. Since the existing bounds are all, they're all not linear, so the trivial bound with a dimension gives n square. Path proposed a bound which was also a quadratic function, but better than the trivial one from Popochenos theorem with a square root, we obtain a bound which is a function of n in the power of one and a half. And the most recent result in this direction is the result by Yaroslav Shitov, which is here a function of n and logarithm. So it's better than any polynomial function, but still is not a linear function. So this is what is known about the length of the full matrix algebra. And now I will continue. So this was the introduction about the length function. And now I would like to talk about the algebras of length one. Um, so from what we have seen about the length, the length of the set and the length of the algebra. So we make some products in elements of the algebra. So in this sense, this length is, uh, it's in some sense measures the multiplicative complexity of the algebra. Uh, so for example, if the algebra is given by a generating set, uh, the, the length bounds uh, the number of multiplications we need to perform in order to obtain a basis of the algebra. And it can be used in some rational procedures. Um, for example, the length plays an important role in, in computational procedures of matrix theory in such problems as unitary similarity of matrices or simultation, term, simultation triangularization of matrices. And so in such computational problems, the length gives the maximal size of the products that we need to consider in order to verify this property, for example, the property of unitary similarity. But, 
and realization of something else. So, if we don't need many multiplications, it is an algebra which is easier to work with. So, um, clearly, uh, an algebra of length zero, so we can have a, an algebra of length zero. This is just the base, the base field F considered as the algebra over itself. It's an algebra of length zero. All other non-trivial algebras has length at least one. So the, the minimal value, the minimal non-trivial value of the length is one. And because of that, we have started this the study of algebras of length one in order to check whether such algebras exist and um, since now we know that they exist but what whether this is a wide class of algebras or not because uh, uh, algebras of length one are the algebras where we don't need to make any multiplication to obtain a basis so all words are just words in generators so this is why they are easier um, to work with because we don't need to perform multiplications to obtain a basis from a generating set the generating set is already a basis so uh, historically first we started with matrix algebras, <laughs> working with matrix algebras and description of matrix algebras of length one. <clears throat> then um, <clears throat> some arbitrary associative algebras of length one. And only recently we have addressed the problem, um, the similar question of describing the algebras of length one, but in the non associative case. Um, um, I think we haven't touched them um, until <laughs> recently because in some sense um, when the algebra is just totally general arbitrary algebra it was unclear how to describe them but so far we uh, obtained a complete description of arbitrary algebras of length one in terms of a basis and the corresponding structure constants mainly using the methods of linear algebra so this is the aim of my talk to present these results about the characterization of algebras of arbitrary algebras of length one. So we start with some general properties of these algebras. First, uh, as I mentioned before, if the length is one, it means that <coughs> having an arbitrary generating set and equipping it with the unit element of the algebra, we, we can see that this set linearly spans in the algebra. And another key observation which we use is that if we have an algebra of length one, well, the algebra has length one if and only if any product of two elements of A is contained as a linear span of identity and these two elements. Uh, what is the idea here is that if it's if it's not contained in this linear space, then this product A B uh, can be uh, this product is already of length two, and if it's not contained in this space, then uh, we would have the length at least two because we can take um, this can take a basis of this algebra containing the product. So um, if if it wasn't in this space, then the length would be at least two. But uh, this condition is also both necessary and sufficient. So it's the characterization of algebras of length one. So here we just have a pair of elements, not a generating set, but for each pair of elements, it happens. happens. As a corollary, we see that the square of each element should be contained in the space generated by the identity in the element itself. And um, 
of course, if an algebra has dimension two, then it will have length one, which falls on this corollary. So since the algebra is unit, we have one and some other element a, and a square is contained here since the dimension of the algebra is two. So <coughs> every unit of algebra of dimension two has length one. So non-trivial case will be algebras with dimension at least equal to three. Notice that any two-dimensional algebra is associative. Uh, then recall what is a power associative algebra. It's an algebra in which every subalgebra generated by a single element is associative. And so it's, it doesn't need to be an associative algebra itself, but one generated subalgebra are associative. Of course, associative algebras are power associative, but as well are Lee, Jordan, and alternative algebras, which are not associative. And <coughs> taking into account that, uh, that any unit of subalgebra generated by an, um, by an element of the algebra, which had length one has dimension at most two, as we have shown before, we have that any algebra of length one is a power associative algebra. So first, of course, algebras of length one are not arbitrary non-associative algebras. They are all power associative. And another nice property of algebras of length one is that uh, if we have a proper subalgebra, such algebra, its length is uh, also equals one. Well, I mean, here it can be zero if it's a base field, but if it's a proper subalgebra not equal to the field, proper multi trivial subalgebra, then it is exactly one. Uh, why this property is nice? Because in general, uh, even in the associative case, it's, it is not true that if we have a subalgebra, then the length of a subalgebra, uh, it shouldn't be smaller than the length of a, an algebra. It is known that the length of a subalgebra can be bigger than the length of the big algebra, and the difference of lengths can be arbitrarily large. Uh, so this monotonicity property of the length is something that doesn't happen for general algebras, but here mm, we have this monotonicity, so the length of a subalgebra is bounded by the length of the algebra. So if the big algebra had length one, then the small also would be length one. And uh, some other properties which are true if the characteristic of the base field doesn't equal to two. Mm. And so for, for uh, recall that in general case, we had the square of the element contained in the space generated by one and the element itself. But when the characteristic of the field is not equal to two, we can say that that we can find a basis B of our algebra such that each square is contained with a linear span of unity, so that each square is a scalar. So it's not in the space contained, uh, spanned by the element itself, but just by the unity. So we, we can form a basis with this property. And if we have such a basis with this property that each square is some constant. And then we can also say something nice about the sum of the products of two distinct elements. So we take the products A i, A j, and A j, A i, and their sum is always also a constant. So we can have a nicer basis with which has these properties and the sum of these two products is a scalar element. So, those were the 
general properties of this algebra of lines one. And this, prop this is the key property of the basis, which we will use further in order to describe the algebras of lines one um, in the in case when the characteristic of the field doesn't equal to two. So for the, the starting point of describing algebras of length one was the description of matrix algebras having length, length one. Uh, when we want to characterize matrix algebras, it is standard uh, to obtain a classification up to conjugation, up to matrix conjugation. So in the following two theorems, in the following two theorems, we will have the algebras of different types are not pairwise conjugate. So there are different types up to matrix conjugation. Or it is what is called matrix similarity. So if our field is not a field of two elements, and we have a matrix algebra containing the identity matrix, so we have a unitary matrix algebra, then it has length equal to one if and only if it is conjugated to with one of the following algebras. These block matrices, when we have scalar blocks on the diagonal with the same scalar in both blocks and on the upper, in the upper right block, we have all matrices from some vectors, so from some zero vector space of rectangular matrices. Um, here, the second class is the algebra when the blocks are scalar, but the scalars may be distinct. But here, the space in Z it can be a zero space as well. So here we can have zero block, and here we, we couldn't have had the zero block. So this is a type of block triangular matrix algebra with matrices with a zero block in the lower left corner, both of them. But as the difference is that here we have coinciding scalars on the diagonal, and here we have two distinct scalars on the diagonal. And the third type, if we have irreducible polynomials of degree two over our field, then we Consider a companion matrix of such polynomial and um, we start forming a block diagonal algebra, and the diagonal blocks are these companion matrices. Um, I mean, we, we have taken the companion matrices and multiplied it by B and added the identity matrix multiplied by A. So this type of uh, the algebra generated by companion matrix of an irreducible polynomial, but since the size of the matrix uh, is not necessary to, we can copy this matrix over the diagonal, but the dimension of course should be an even number for this to happen. So if the field wasn't the field of two elements, we have three types of matrix algebras, which have x two and x one. And we see that in every example, the algebras of some block type, which are block triangular or block diagonal, as in the last case. And for the field of two elements, we have one additional algebra. We have we can have three blocks on the diagonal with zeros elsewhere. So if we have this three blocks. Of course, we don't have three distinct numbers, x, y, and z over the field of two elements, but we can have these matrices with three blocks. And this algebra as well has lines one. So this is something that couldn't happen when over the field with at least three elements. And the same three algebras as we had in the previous case. So here as a con we had just so we consider the irreducible polynomial, but over the field of two num of two element field, we had just one irreducible polynomial of degree one is the polynomial x square plus x plus one. So it's 
Ich bin kein Jung mehr Kids. Okay, ich bin hier. So, we have this complete uh, classification of such algebras up to conjugation, up to matrix similarity. Uh, since every associative algebra, finite dimensional associative algebra has a matrix representation based on matrix results here, for arbitrary finite dimensional associative algebra, you can say that it has length one, if and only if it is one of the algebras in the following list. So direct sum of two copies of the base field, uh, two dimensional uh, field. So algebra A itself is the field, but not the base field F, but it's two dimensional extension. If the field was the field of two elements, also a direct sum of three copies of the base field. An algebra, so J is a Jacobson radical of our algebra. So algebra with a non zero Jacobson radical, which have square zero, and the quotient algebra having dimension one. So the quotient algebra B has a base field. And this type of local algebras and the fifth class of algebras when we can have two idempotents E and F such that they're orthogonal idempotents meaning that this, the products are zero, their sum is the identity element and the dimension of diagonal blocks space E, A, E, and F, A, F is one, and um, one of non-diagonal non spaces is zero, and the other is non-zero. So this is um, what we had from this algebra um, of this type in its matrix representation. And algebras of different types are not isomorphic, and two algebras of type four or two algebras of type five are isomorphic if, if and only if they have the same dimensions. Algebras of different types are distinct up to isomorphs. So this is what is known as the associative case. So you see that in the associative case we have this nice description. Um, I mean, it is structure, structure description of the isomorphism, but uh, in the non-associative case, in the, um, the class of such is much wider. So, so far we weren't able to obtain such a structure result. I mean, this isomorphism or this, the structure description of algebras and some algebra for particular type, but we describe them in terms of basis and the multiplication multiplica multiplica rules in this basis. So let us consider non-associative case. First, we consider the smallest possible dimension equal to three that behaves in a different way from other dimensions. So we can say that the algebra of dimension three, and if it has a basis with these properties that I have described before for in general, algebras of length one, if it contains a basis of these types, then already should have length one. So for three dimensional case, this is a necessary and sufficient condition for algebra to have length one and to have any basis containing the unit element and two other elements such that these products are scalars. The squares and the sum of the products are scalars. This is necessary and sufficient condition on the basis of this algebra to have length one. And 
And notice that here we can see the case when the characteristic of the base field is not two. So here um, in this remainder, in, in this theorem, the field, the characteristic of the field is different from two. Let's say that two elements are similar if there are differences of scalar. Oh. I think I, I don't use it in the formulation of the theorem, but I mean that we hear that we, sometimes we write one and sometimes we said this is, these elements are similar, meaning that there are differences with the scalar. So when the dimension is at least four, the length is one, if and only if there is the basis of our algebra such that squares of all elements are constants and for every pair of distinct indices there are the scalars in the base field such that this product uh, is contained in the linear space spanned by the three elements so this is what we know from general properties but here we also should have that this constants coincide for when we have the second index transcending so bij equals bkj for any ij and k for any distinct numbers ij and k so we have the same constants and this is a characterization of the basis of an arbitrary algebra of length one or one of the field of characteristic different from two and seven dimension at least four and this is the condition of the basis so this this constants coincide if the second index is in the same well so this is something that is applicable to arbitrary non associative algebra, but then we started considering some particular important classes of non associative algebras. And for example, we have considered Jordan algebras. I recall that the Jordan non associative algebra is an algebra satisfying two identities the identity of commutativity and the Jordan identity. Mm. Examples of Jordan algebras include the algebra obtained from associative algebra. So we can make a Jordan algebra from an associative algebra, changing the original associative product by the new product, given by the sum of products of these elements. Since here we divide by two, of course, we can do it. And the Jordan algebra of a bilinear form of the sun vector space with the following multiplication rule. Here, phi is the bilinear form. So, these are particular examples of Jordan algebras. And here we can say that the unit of algebra have a length one and having a basis given by the previous theorem. So, I'm sorry about the numbers. It's I mean, by the theorem 18, I mean, in this theorem about the basis, this would be our main theorem about the basis in non associative case. And if our algebra is given by this basis from this theorem, then the following conditions are equivalent that the algebra is a Jordan algebra, that it's already a commutative algebra, and the following condition on the structure constants that coefficients alpha ij and alpha ji are the same and beta ij are zero for all distinct indices i and j. And this color we can see that Jordan algebras of a symmetric bilinear form are the only possible unit of Jordan algebras of length one. So the not many algebras, Jordan algebras of length one, which are the algebras of constructed in the previous example for bilinear forms. Just this algebra, Jordan algebra has 
that's one. How the associative case fits here? So for associative, you know, because we can also uh, reformulate uh, the result about the basis and uh, our algebra of f1 is associative. If and only if for the basis satisfy the conditions of the main theorem, I recall these conditions. And the following additional conditions are satisfied with the coefficient mu i here from the square equals the square of coefficient beta and the, the coefficient alpha i j and alpha j i they are equal and they equal the product of two betas with i j and beta j i. And from previous theorem it is possible to construct non examples of non-associative algebras of lens one. Uh, if we know the general structure of the basis here, and if we know the description of a basis of an associative algebra, we can take some constants that don't satisfy these two conditions in order to guarantee that our algebra will be a non-associative non one. For, for example, take a three-dimensional algebra with the products given by the following table. So the square of A is zero, the square of B is B, so B is unimportant, and the product AB is two, two multiplied by the identity plus A plus B, whether the product of BA is minus A minus B, it's a non-associative algebra and has length of one. So from the theorem, knowing the structural constants for an associative algebra, knowing the behavior of structural constants for general algebra, we can um, construct some examples of non-associative algebras of length one. And uh, the remaining case is a case of characteristic two. So in characteristic two, the description of the basis is uh, slightly different. Mm. And the description is different again for dimension three and for bigger dimensions. So in dimension three, our algebra has length one if and only if and we have the following multiplication rules for the basis elements. So squares can be expressed. Um, they are similar to these elements where delta is zero or one and the products are also similar to, to this sums for, with the following identities satisfied by these constants. So this is the identity that should happen in order to have length one. And, um, but that happened over the two element field. And if we had its proper extension, then we have the following rules for the constant. So this is the multiplication table. So we have squares, we have products of different elements, and we have the identity satisfied by the constants that their sums are zero. So this is the description of three-dimensional non-associative algebras over characteristic two. And um, if the dimension is greater than three, then there is no difference for the field of two elements and its proper extension. So we have just this one theorem that algebra of dimension at least four have length one if and only if uh, there is a basis and scalars such that you know, one of the two following conditions is satisfied. First, you can have a basis where all squares of elements are similar to zero and the products A, I, and J, and A, J, A, I are similar and are this sum similar to the sum of elements or either the, they're all idempotents in the basis, not similar to be net importance and then this product is similar to such some of elements. When recall this similarity means that they are different, the difference is a scalar element. So this is a description of 
such algebras of lens one in terms of their basis for lens and characteristic of the field equal to two. And um, well, this is all I wanted to present for today. So thanks everyone for the attention. And please maybe if there are some comments or questions. Okay, thank you. So any comment or questions? Yes, I have a question. Hi, Olga. Your main theorem gives us a, a description of algebras of length one in terms oh, of a. Can wait for some moment? Maybe I should change my headset or just uh, uh, turn on the sound of, on my laptop because I don't hear everyone very well. I mean, the uh, sound is very low for, for some reason. Um, maybe I should change it to my notebook or just. Mm -hmm. Turn on my headset. So, can we try again? Maybe we'll hear. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Now it's much better than with the headset. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I don't know the reason. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so my question is Your main theorem gives us a description of algebra on length one in terms of a special basis or the existence of a special basis. And the question is if we can use it to determine if a fixed algebra has length one. So does we have an, uh, an efficient or an effective procedure to determine if a given algebra has a basis of this special kind? Well, first I think we can start making products just taking products of two elements and seeing whether this product is in the span of these two elements as identity. I think this is the first property, how we can check it. I think this is the first idea. But thank you very much for this question. I think we haven't formulated in like an algorithm, but I think this can be done, yes, in some algorithm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for question. No question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is about uh, an algebra generated by uh, I put it. Uh, maybe we can think that it is an algebra of uh, length one or not. Mm, yes, if you have an algebra, if you have a unitary algebra generated by another idempotent, it's a two-dimensional algebra, yes, it has length one. Uh, yeah, and uh, about uh, uh, algebra of Jordan type, Because uh, I'm really interested in of the length of an axial algebra, and what do you think of it? Mm. Well, I think I, I haven't considered uh, this particular class of algebras, so I can't say anything at the moment. But it, yes, it would be interesting to consider this class of algebra. So we say excellent algebra, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. There are some more questions. Okay, I think it's time. So let us thank uh, Professor Olga uh, Mokowa again. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for the attention. Thank you very much.